how's it going? And I'm a little nervous about providing this tutorial today just because it's on the path tracer and there's a lot of different settings here. And I don't necessarily want to say there's a right or wrong way. And a lot of it is you have to kind of find out what works for you. So it's a lot like baking a cake. You know how I bake it, it may not work for you. But this is just a general guide to get you started and to encourage your own experimentation with the render settings yourself so you can see with your own eyes what you think's right. And so don't take this as the gospel, please. So anyway, to start with this, we're just gonna go ahead and go into games and third person. We'll just leave it called My Project 4 and go create. I was been working on this for a few hours. I've been trying different rendering settings and so this kind of goes to the heart of really what's going on with this is that this involves a trade-off between samples and rendering time. The more samples you have, the higher quality your renders are going to be, but the longer the render is going to take. And when I say longer, I mean it could take a lot longer. Like it could take 10 hours to render 600 frames, which really isn't that long, really. It's just a not even, what is that, 30 frames per second. So it's like 20 seconds of video could take 10 hours to render. That's a little crazy, right? So it's a trade-off that you have to come to terms with on your own. How much time do you have to wait for the render? How long are you willing to wait for the render? One strategy you could do, and I would recommend, is start on the kind of the low side and then work your way up if you're noticing problems with the footage. That way you're not just spending all this time rendering for no reason if you're not really getting any appreciable gains on your renders. With that said, let's go ahead and get started. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I just want something to film, so I'm gonna get a mannequin here, and we'll go animations, and I like to get Quinn here and just drag her onto the scene here, and I like to rotate her 90 degrees, so she'll probably be facing the camera when I bring the camera in. And I do want a camera too, so I'm going to go ahead and get a city camera and drag that into the scene as well. And then you can see it's already pointing at her. If I bring it in by default, it's pointing straight at her if I rotate her 90 degrees. Okay, so then that's, we got something to film. And the reason I'm not getting some other dramatic, exotic thing to film is that I just want to walk you through the basics of how to set this up. Why do we want to set up path tracing? Because it is what's going to give us the highest quality renders. So if you have a short film to make or anything like that, you're going to want to render it out with path tracing because it's going to give you the highest quality. So, and like I said, there's quite a few settings and so I'll try to go over them as fast as I can. So anyway, just to get started, we need to enable path tracing and to do that, We've got to come up here and go into project settings and we're going to come down here to rendering here and if we scroll down there's a category just for path tracing see and notice this is interesting that it's it's checked true but it's dimmed out which means it's not active so to activate it we really need to turn on this support for ray tracing it's going to tell you that it also needs to enable skin cache and that's a big yes so then we do that and it wants to restart, but we'll restart later because there's a couple other things we need to do. And the other thing we can double check is if we type in RHI, which is Rendering Hardware Interface, we just want to make sure that it's set to DirectX 12, and it is. So that was set by default, so we didn't need to worry about that. And then we just need to go and do a couple more settings here. We'll go into, I believe it's Project Settings, and let's search for Auto Exposure. And let's just go ahead and turn that off. And I see it's got a bias there of one that seems to stay on. And we can delete that then. And then the next thing, the last thing is we did that. We need to go into our plugins. We go into our plugins here and we gotta search for something called movie render queue. And click that. And then we're gonna you don't have to do this next step, but I would recommend it is search for ProRes right here and you have to enable that. And so if you're not going to export your footage as an EXR sequence, which you might do if you're going into DaVinci Resolve, the next best option for high quality would be Apple ProRes, which is a completely legitimate and professional codec to use. So I would say use ProRes 
some video editing softwares don't even let you import EXR. So ProRes would be the next highest quality. And then if you can't do ProRes, then the PNG sequence. Okay, and now we got all that done, we just go ahead and do the big restart here, save everything, and now it's got a restart. That should be the only restart that we, we need to do. And when we start back up, path tracing should be enabled. So how do we know if it's enabled? Well, we can just, I can select Quinn and go F. If I come down here and under Lit, go to Path Tracing, you'll see how it's resolving. So when it has that kind of fuzzy pixelated look, that means it's, it's on and it's calculating all the light bounces and stuff like that. Try not to get on a cube here. So, and then it gives you this little timer telling you how long it takes to render out the scene, the actual footage. So you can see it's taking a while just for it to render this, what we're looking at here in the viewport. Now, if we come up here and we go to post process volume, it has this category just for path tracing here, right here. And these are very interesting settings to me. So in another software programs that I use, like in a program I use called Lightwave, the most max bounces, the bounces you have to use is like three or four. You never use over three or four. So I don't know where 32 comes on. It seems like an awful lot of bounces if you ask me by default. So I don't know that you need that many. So you might just do something like eight and see if you notice any problems with glass or in the indirect shadow areas or something like that. I saw somebody had used 10 by default and that seemed to work, so eight or 10, try that. Samples per pixels is kind of a big one. If you think about it, that seems like a lot of samples per pixels, you know? So since they seem to be doing this in increments of powers of two, I would say try 512. So what I'm doing right now is I'm leaning on the less samples for a faster render but you could go up higher but you'll see your rendering times are going to increase exponentially if 512 doesn't work then i go to 1024 and if that doesn't work i go to 2048 I, I would bump up from there just to see and keep in mind this is the most important thing these settings like the bouncing and the bouncing really affects like glass and indirect areas here in the indirectly lit shadow areas and the samples affect the noise so the more samples the less noise that we're probably going to have but it also increases the the rendering time but just keep in mind that these settings affect noise so if we render with these settings and we're not seeing noise then we can go with these settings if you render and you're seeing noise then you got to come back and increase these settings but why increase them unnecessarily if it's not if there's no noise? So try a lower setting and see if you see any noise. If you don't see any noise, then you know this is good and you got a faster render time. The filter width is by default, it's three. I don't see any need to change that. This setting is specifically for dealing with artifacts or what they call fireflies. So I notice if it's set and it's just set to one that it seems to help. So you might wanna just leave that on. This affects the whether the atmosphere is on, and this references your depth of field. You can look those up. That doesn't really affect our noise level. But notice when I turn this one on, the clouds go away. So I kind of like the clouds there. And then the denoiser, some people say to turn it on, some people say to turn it off. I'd say, yeah, go ahead and turn it off. I would just use it as a last resort. So. If you've tried increasing your samples and your and your render times are blowing up, then maybe try the denoiser and see. It's going to you're going to lose some detail when you use it, but again, it's all a trade-off between the time you have to render. How much time do you have to wait to render? Do you mind if your computer's tied up for 24 hours? I mean, it just depends. I don't really want my computer tied up <laughs> unless I got another computer. So maybe I would turn on the denoiser, but I would save it as the last resort. And then that's all. But what you can do, and this is the greatest thing, is that you can play with these settings in real time because every time I move or change the scene, it's readjusting. So you can play with these settings and see if it makes any difference. Right here on the viewport, you can come in and look closer at her and see, are you noticing any noise on her or not? And then if not, you can go 1024. But even at these settings, it's going to take a while 
to render out. But just keep in mind, these are just for noise. If you don't see noise, you don't, there's no need to increase those. Okay, so what I was going to do was try to render out a shot, and I don't want to take up too much time doing that. But let's just go ahead and set up a quick little shot here. So to do that, I'm going to right-click and go into Cinematics and go New Level Sequence right here. Double-click into it. We're going to select Quinn in the scene. We'll go add sequencer, add her right there. It's going to put us in animation mode, which I don't really want to be in. I'm going to go ahead and delete her control rig. And then for her animation, we lost her animation. So we'll go ahead and give her, her idle back right there. Now she's all set up. We already have a camera in the scene. So come over here, go to track add the sequencer, we're going to add our cine camera and now we're seeing what our cine camera is seeing and it put us back in animation mode. I don't know why it keeps doing that. And you can tell we're out of focus so with the cine camera selected I should be able to fix that. So if we stop down on the aperture we can get her in focus. The field of view is fine. I'm just going to make it a nice little short clip here so it's going to be about 150 frames. I'm not going to increase it. And then all we have to do is just animate the camera a little bit just to add some interest to it. I'm not sure which we're on, the X or the Y. Let's see. Turn on auto keyframe right there. And let's see what does X do. Okay, so X pulls us back. So we'll pull back just a little bit like right there. We'll go ahead and set a keyframe. And then we do have to come up to camera cuts and add our camera and then click that little icon too. So that that's that. And then all we'll do is click this little control here to take our playhead to the end. And then on the X axis, we're just going to push in a little bit like that. And there we've got just a, a basic little shot, a little dolly in shot there like that. Okay, and you can see it's all path tracing. Okay, so now the last thing we're going to do is try to render this out. We'll go here into this, and we're going to go in here to save. And probably the most important thing is to put this in a, its own little file. So I do have a folder already set up for this on my desktop, and it's the new folder for, and I'll select that folder. We're going to do 1920 by 1080. We're going to do this at 30 frames per second. Everything else looks good there on our output settings. Now, these yellow things are just switches. So right now it's set for deferred rendering, which we don't want. So we'll turn that off. And we don't want a JPEG, and we're going to turn that off. And there's only three settings on here we're going to mess around with. So we're going to go into settings. Here is our export option. So if you're going to go into DaVinci Resolve, I would say go ahead and do an EXR sequence because you got 16 bits and that would give you the most latitude in color correction, color grading. Apple ProRes would be the next step down and that's what I can use. So I would say Apple ProRes is perfectly fine. Go back into settings and then we want to turn on Path Tracer and when there's nothing else we need to set here. Go back to settings and here's where I think a lot of people get confused and they maybe make it more complicated than it is. So by default, it's going to sample at 8. It's doing a sample count of 8. So what we can do, though, is we can increase that. And this, this doesn't have anything to do with noise reduction. This has to do with aliasing. That's where you see jagged edges along objects. So it's, I call, they call it the jaggies. So it doesn't have anything to do with that. It has related to aliasing, where you see sharp lines where it's supposed to be smooth. So it's like you'd see a curve and instead of seeing a curve you see bumps. So that's aliasing. So this takes care of that. So if you're using, and this is according to Unreal's documentation themselves, if it's just going to render out a still photo and you want to increase over 8. If you're not going to put more than 8 here then don't even bother messing with this. So we're going to do at least 16. If we're going to do a still image it would be 16 1. But then if you rendered it out and you still saw jagged edges, then we'd bump it up to 32. If you rendered it out and you still saw jagged edges, you'd render it up to 64. If you saw, still saw it, you'd go up to 128 and you keep going. But this is for if you're doing still images. If you're doing motion like we're doing, we would go 16, 
16 to 1. And if we notice jagged edges, then we would bump it up to 32. And it says right here, if the product is greater than the TTTA sample is currently 8, then TAA is ineffective. And you should consider overriding AA to none for better quality. So it's just telling you right there, is greater than the number is currently 8, then override. So we're going to override that, right? So we're going to have our sample set to 16. And that's all we have to do. That's all the settings basically we have to do. There's a lot more to it than this, but that's the basics. And then all we got to do is go render and it's going to start going. Now you'll see it's rendering relatively quickly here, but keep in mind that our samples are pretty low. So I have it at 512, but I could easily have it at 1028. And then I could have left it on the default of 2048. And that would have increased the rendering time quite a bit. But you can see for every single frame that's rendering, 16 subframes are rendering. And this is only 150 frames. So this is a lot slower. This is offline rendering. So at the end of this video, I'll show this. I'll render this out and you can take a look at it. And you can see if there's any things that could be improved. But I could, if I watch the footage myself and see any problems, then I'll just go back and increase the samples. And like I said, at the worst case, I would turn on the denoiser and risk giving up the details. But like I said, I don't want to tie up my computer for 24 hours. So that's just something that every person has to decide for themselves. It's one of those balances, you know? So anyway, I hope you found this helpful. This was just a quick introduction into path tracing in Unreal Engine.